Why don't we have monarchies rule over us anymore? For thousands of years, most of humanity lived in kingdoms or empires ruled by a monarchy. But in the last 250 years, almost every country switched to a different system. Look at these two maps of the world. On the left, you see the different governments people had about 250 years ago, and they are almost all monarchies. But on the right, there are barely any monarchies left anymore. So what happened? How did this form of government almost completely disappear? And sure, there are countries like Sweden or Japan that have monarchies, yet they don't have any political power anymore. They are basically just democracies pretending to be monarchies. In the 15th century, European countries were mostly feudal societies. This is a system where a monarch ruled over the nobles, but they were often still their equals in terms of authority. A king could usually only control the lands they directly owned. If they wanted to implement a law in a region owned by another lord, then that lord could simply refuse. If the king would send his army to enforce his decision, the other nobility would realize that they might be the king's next target and they all joined together against their ruler. These nobles would all raise their own taxes, implement their own laws and have their own armies. And they would use those armies against the king to replace him with somebody whom the nobles liked more. In some parts of the world, the king was inferior to other powerful nobility and was basically just their employee. This system existed in many forms all over the world, from the Aztec Empire to Japan to Europe. While examples like Rome or the Chinese Empire are famous for having rather centralized governments, they were the exception. Look at any country in history, from the Americas to Africa to Europe, and you will most likely find a feudal society. But this all started to change at the end of the Middle Ages in Turkey. Here, the Ottoman Empire was surrounded by more powerful states and its rulers were forced to place all their power into the Sultan. So one person could quickly make decisions to protect the nobility and their people. This made it much easier to organize armies and raise taxes. So easy, in fact, that the Ottomans could create a powerful professional army under the command of the Sultan himself. Whenever the empire expanded, the Sultan would select people from the nobility to rule over these newly conquered territories. And because of his army, the Sultan could enact his laws almost anywhere in his empire around this time. This made the Ottoman Empire one of the first centralized governments and gave them a lot of power. In contrast, most of the world was either a tribal society or a feudal society. So, what changed? Why would nobles willingly hand over power to their king to set tax policy, make laws or have their own army? And in Europe in particular, the Ottoman Empire was an existential threat, an unstoppable force of nature that no European country could stand up against. And so to protect themselves, these Europeans began centralizing their own government, modeled on the Ottoman government. And this process started with France. The French monarchy began by making a few laws that required people to enforce those laws. These jobs would then be filled by French nobility. This was a great place for your children to work at. In most cases, only the eldest son would inherit your lands and titles. Your other sons would often get very little and had to find some other way of making a living. But now, it became possible for your children to get a good position in the government to secure your child's well-being and to give your family more power in the government. In essence, the king started hiring unemployed nobles to work for him. But they needed some way to pay for these new employees. And so they simply sold these jobs to the highest bidder. It is estimated that in the 16th century alone, 50,000 government officers were sold by the French crown. The king earned a lot of money this way, and he wanted to keep earning money. But eventually you run out of positions to fill in your government. So what do you do as a king? Well, you create more positions. Let's give an example of how this would go. The king wanted to sell more government offices. So, his court would create new laws. And then they would need some way to enforce those laws. So he would set up new courts throughout France and sell the position of judges, lawyers and other important jobs to various nobility around the country. In the 16th century, 65 such courts were created. Well, seeing as there are now so many laws, they needed some organization to help implement new laws so the king could focus on other things. So, two new parliaments were created to help the king all members of which bribed the king to get this new position in parliament. 
After all, if you were a powerful lord, you'd probably want some way of influencing the creation of new laws. And through parliament, it became possible to bribe the king to make up new laws that protected the nobility, such as making it illegal to walk on the private property of the nobles, and a police force those nobles could use for their own benefit. First, a single police force in France in 1667. But 30 years later, in 1699, the king decreed police forces needed to be set up all over France. And of course, this meant they needed a lot of high-ranking police officers to manage all the regular police officers, meaning there were a lot of new officers to fill with nobles. But now that the king received so many bribes and needed to pay so many salaries, he needed to hire accountants to manage the government's finances. And what did the French government do with all this money they got? Well, they spent it on making the king more powerful. France created a standing army and navy with generals and admirals selected from the nobility. They created a colonial empire that needed governors selected from the nobility. And on and on it goes. But this government is becoming very complex at this point. So it was probably a good idea to hire more counselors for the king to delegate tasks to. These were some of the few positions that you couldn't bribe your way to. But for this one, you actually had to show the king you were competent at your job or he would fire you. But even counselors need people to work under them. And so support positions were created filled with nobility. But now laws are getting more and more complex. So you need some experts to make sure new laws don't clash with the old laws. So they hired lawyers to work for the king. And many of the people working for the king had children of their own. These children also wanted a job working for the king in some capacity. And so they would use their salary to buy a position for their children. So in essence, the salary the king gave to his employees often ended back with the king. Some people wanted to have a permanent position for the family and would buy a hereditary position, meaning that when the person in that position died, he could pass it on to his children. Some wealthy merchants even used this system to buy their way into the nobility. And if you were very good at your job, then you might even get promoted to a higher position. And so the bureaucracy kept expanding for centuries. With each new law, each new bribe and each new job, the king would gain a little bit more power until eventually the king became the state, where the king was responsible for everything. So for example, if the monarch decides a canal needs to be dug somewhere, can you tell I'm Dutch yet? If the monarch decides a canal needs to be dug somewhere, then it happens. Nobody has the authority to stop the construction of that canal. And nobody had the authority to make their own canal either without the king's consent. The king was the only person allowed to make such a decision. This system is called an absolute monarchy. So to answer the question, why did local lords hand over their power to the king? In short, everybody benefited from this arrangement. The king got a lot of money by selling positions of power. The nobility got to put their children in positions of power and people who worked hard might gain a higher position in the social hierarchy for them and their family. So the nobility was willing to go along with this system because they gave up a small amount of power while securing new positions of power for their children and their family as a whole. The process towards a central government took hundreds of years, giving a little bit of power to the king and receiving a little bit of security from the king every year. Nobody in France actively realized they were creating an absolute monarchy until it was already too late. As more government jobs were created, the king became more powerful, resulting in the creation of more government jobs. Until eventually, everyone tried to please the king because the entire nobility was dependent on the monarchy for their power and wealth. By the end of the 17th century, the French king became responsible for basically everything in the country. By becoming an absolute monarchy and centralizing all power with the king, he could direct the resources of his entire country towards whatever pursuit he wished. He expanded France's borders, established colonies and created large armies. By the 17th and 18th centuries, France became the most powerful kingdom in Europe. And this was a problem for everyone else. Look at this graph. 
Each of these lines represents a year in the 17th century. The red ones represent a year with at least one major European war. The blue ones represent peace. In this century, Europe knew a total of three years of peace. That's three years without someone trying to conquer the land from somebody else. And the most successful conquerors were countries that had centralized their political power instead of having a feudal society where every lord ruled over their own piece of land. European nobility was well aware that a single lost war could mean the end for them and their family. Because if you conquer new territory, the winner would generally replace you with somebody loyal to the new government. So European nobility basically had a choice. They could either centralize like France and the Ottoman Empire had done, or they could remain a feudal society and wait for someone else to conquer them. And so most nobility gave up their power and handed it over to their monarch in order to hold on to the wealth and power they still had left. Everyone in Europe began to centralize their government. From the 16th to the 17th centuries, the royal governments raised four times more money, employed four times more people, and increased the size of Europe's professional army from 20,000 in the 16th century to 150,000 in the 17th century. And this centralization went in two distinct directions that would cause two separate ends to the monarchies. The first was absolute monarchies like we talked about already. We already discussed France, but also in Russia, Austria, and, most successfully, Brandenburg, did we have absolute monarchies. For those unaware, this is the kingdom after which the Brandenburg Gate is named. It would eventually turn into the Kingdom of Prussia and then the German Empire. It found itself constantly at war with those around them and thus needed the nobility to stay in line to assure internal stability and create a powerful military to fight off foreign invaders. This meant that more and more authority was handed over to the king. This turned Brandenburg from a minor backwater into the powerful kingdom of Prussia and by the 19th century was able to fend off major powers like Austria, France and Russia to form Germany. The wealth and prosperity of today's Germany and France can be traced back to their centralization of power. And in the case of Germany, we can see their desire for a strong leader resulting in two strong leaders whose personal insecurities led to two world wars. If you want to understand the modern world, it is important to understand how the current system of government came to place. And that started with the end of feudalism and the start of centralized government. But then there is the other form of centralization, constitutional monarchy. Countries like this include Sweden, Japan, and my own country, the Netherlands. All right, you might have noticed something about absolute monarchies and constitutional monarchies. Pause the video to look at the list of countries that were either absolute or constitutional if you want to see if you notice something interesting. The answer is that countries that had absolute monarchies no longer have any monarchy at all today, while constitutional monarchies still tend to have a king or queen, but with almost no power. So, what did constitutional monarchies do differently? In the 17th century, England was a backwater in Europe. Its population was only a quarter that of France. Their people were relatively poor compared to the rest of Europe, and they didn't even have a standing army because their only major threat was Scotland. In 1629, the king wanted to get more power like his counterpart in France. So, he decided to impose new taxes and tariffs. But unlike in France, the English nobility and landowners resisted. They already had a parliament made up of nobles and they essentially refused to hand over any new taxes to their king on top of what they were already paying. And so the king dismissed parliament and started a bloody civil war to get his way until he was executed 20 years later. The nobility replaced him with a man who was just as authoritarian. And so after his death, they decided that instead of electing a new king who would inevitably try to take more power for themselves, the nobles would instead share their power with the king instead of handing it over. From now on, the king would still rule the country, but his decisions had to be approved by the nobles sitting in parliament. And if England wanted to centralize the government, the nobility would have control over that central government. And disagreement on who had what type of power was written down in a constitution. Hence why this type of government was called constitutional monarchy. England then did many of the same things that France had done. They created a royal bureaucracy. It's actually still around today, it's called the civil service. They created a large army and centralized tax collection. But 
all under the oversight of the nobility. And in the next 200 years, Great Britain surpassed France as the most powerful country in Europe. Anyone who thought they needed a single powerful king to have a strong country was proven wrong. The nobility didn't need to hand over power at all. They could instead join the central government and rule alongside the king and other nobles. The nobility didn't necessarily have to give up their power in order to be a strong and stable nation. And so for the next two centuries, Europe found itself in an ideological battle. Should we be an absolute monarchy or a constitutional monarchy, with France on one side and Great Britain on the other, similar to the Cold War between capitalism and Soviet-style communism, or the Reformation between Catholicism and basically almost every other Christian. And this new ideological battle was fought all over Europe. Because whenever a country centralized power, the king tried to take it all for themselves, and the nobility was unwilling to hand it over. Because when the king gets absolute power, they can take everything from the nobility. Their power, their wealth, their privileges can all be taken away. And so for centuries, the elites of Europe fought over who should control the government. For example, in 1675, Sweden nearly lost a war against Denmark because the Danish had centralized their government and could field a better army than the Swedes. After kicking out the Danish, the nobility agreed to becoming an absolute monarchy if that king would protect them from invaders. After a few decades, Sweden was a secure country and the nobility wanted their power back. This happened in 1719, during a succession crisis, where the nobility chose the side of whoever was willing to give them their political power back. And so, Sweden became a constitutional monarchy. This process was later repeated in the end of the 18th century, when King Gustav III overthrew his own government to solve a crisis and made himself absolute monarch. He stabilized the country, however, his son lost Finland in a war to Russia, and the elites forced their monarch out of power again and restored the constitutional monarchy. In the 19th century, Austria ruled over a diverse country with dozens of different ethnic groups. The Hungarians rebelled and the Austrians lost several major wars, causing people to question whether the empire would survive at all. And so the nobility asked the Hungarians to join the Austrian government and rule the empire together as equals to prevent further rebellions. The Hungarians agreed as long as the king gave up most of his power and let the nobility rule the country. And thus the Austrian absolute monarchy became the Austro-Hungarian constitutional monarchy in 1860. And stories like this were taking place all over Europe. My own country of the Netherlands gained independence as a republic in the 16th century. Then Napoleon took over, turned it into an absolute monarchy, until the incompetence of those kings resulted in the 1848 revolution, at least in the Netherlands, and we became a constitutional monarchy like we are today. And people kept fighting for centuries over which type of monarchy they wanted. Until people started asking themselves whether they needed a monarchy at all. Several countries up to that point had been ruled without kings. The Republic of Venice, the Dutch Republic or the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Yet these were still ruled by the nobility. But this changed with the US Revolution in the 1770s. After getting angry at taxes, they declared independence and in the end decided that their leader would not be a king. Instead, the landowners of European descent could choose anyone from amongst themselves to become president. In theory, anyone with the right religion, skin color and wealth could come to rule a country. This was a revolutionary idea in a world where almost every ruler was born into a royal family. And this idea spread to Europe and became very, very popular in the late 18th century because at the end of that century, France was an absolute monarchy where the king decided on everything, both good and bad. He received all the praise, but also all the blame. Whenever there was an issue with the government, the blame ultimately fell on the king. And at the end of the 18th century, the French had a lot of blame to give to the king. They had fought expensive wars, for example. They fought the War of Austrian Succession, costing 1 billion livres. The Seven Years' War costed 1.8 billion, and supporting the USA's independence cost another 1.3 billion livres, while the government only earned about 600,000 livres per year. These wars were expensive, and in order to pay for all of this, the government decided to raise taxes on peasants and not the wealthy elites. On top of that, the crops failed, and France now also had a famine. To quote my favorite YouTuber again, 
If you or your family start going hungry, see how long you remain a law-abiding citizen. If these issues had happened in a feudal society, there could be a dozen or hundreds of groups, each angry at their local lord. But France's centralized government meant that all these poor, overtaxed, hungry peasants could look towards one person who they could blame for everything. An entire country was united in their anger towards their king. And so the French Revolution started. For the purposes of this video, the most important thing this revolution did was that the average people of France killed their king. This wasn't a struggle for the crown between the king and some nobles. This wasn't a foreign invader, this wasn't some plot. This was the people of France deposing their own king. The people of the Kingdom of France created the Republic of France. This was a completely new phenomena in Europe at the time. And now the French needed to create a new system upon which to base their government. For a thousand years, the king was the king because God appointed him to be the king. Average people could not simply depose and install a new king because that would go against God's plan. But in the 18th century, scientists had proven that much of the universe functions on scientific principles and not on God's. That a person could, for example, predict the movement of the planets using math and that gravity was the force keeping our solar system together and people stuck on Earth. This wasn't God's work, this was gravity's work. But if even something as mysterious as the moon was ruled by natural processes, then why not also the king? Why should a king not abide by certain laws the same way nature abides by certain laws? To us today, this is obvious. It doesn't matter where you live on earth. People generally agree that their leaders need to have a good reason to be the ruler of their country. In China, this is economic growth. In Western countries, our leader is our leader because we chose them to be our leader. Even the Vatican elects their pope, for example. But in the 18th century, this idea was radical. From then on, a new idea would spread around the world. Authority should derive from the consent of the governed, not from the threat of force. I never thought I'd say this, but yeah, listen to Barbie, everyone. And people from around the world took inspiration from the French Revolution. Fed up with their own nobility abusing them, corrupt officials, and a king who didn't seem to care for the common people, revolutions started across the world. Quite literally, nothing was sacred anymore. All power, all authority, all institutions were now conditional valid only as long as they could be justified in terms of rationality and utility. How useful that person or system is to the people of the country. And these newly independent countries did not want another king to rule over them. They chose different systems of governments and different reasons why they should govern. In Venezuela, the first president was popular with the people, allied himself with the oligarchy, and they ruled the country together on the premise that the president was good for the people. In Chile, the ruler of the country was the man who led the war of independence and maintained the social structure that kept his supporters in power. Or look at Haiti, where a slave revolt ended their colonial rule and in 1804 elected their own king. They were all inspired by the ideas of the French Revolution and decided to get rid of absolute monarchies for something else. Presidents, revolutionaries, or elected kings. And this trend continued. In Europe, the idea of democracy was becoming popular. Before the French Revolution, democracy was thought of as being the same as anarchy. Because if everybody gets to decide, your political system will become a mess of infighting that won't be able to achieve anything. Interestingly enough, anti-democratic countries today, such as China, still use this exact same argument from 250 years ago. And as more people were moving to the cities to work in the factories, they started demanding more rights. And the rulers of those countries were afraid they would meet the same fate as the rulers of France. The guillotine. We would like to animate this, but unfortunately history scope characters don't have any necks. The elites of Europe were so afraid of a revolution that European countries began introducing democracy into their political system. France was the first in 1792, allowing all men the right to vote for parliament. Spain allowed a limited democracy in 1810, Portugal 1820, and when Greece became independent from the Ottoman Empire, they did so as a constitutional monarchy where all men could vote for parliament. And a major event happened with the 1848 revolutions where all over Europe, people demanded more political rights. In most places, these revolutions were put down, 
but in the German states, Denmark and the Netherlands, the people were able to force through democratic constitutions, turning these countries into constitutional monarchies. And in that same year, the Communist Manifesto was published. Regardless of your own opinion on communist philosophy, it is hard to overstate the impact of this book on the last 170 years in history. This book describes a process where the elites hold so much power and wealth that the rest of society would be left with just enough money to stay alive, work and make new children to work in the factories, while the elites have more money than they could possibly spend in a lifetime. According to the Communist Manifesto, these impoverished people will eventually start a revolution to take this power and wealth for themselves. And keep in mind that the Communist Manifesto was written only 50 years after the French Revolution, and that the world was in the middle of the Age of Revolutions. The process described in the Communist Manifesto seemed very accurate with what was going on in Europe at the time, and would be proven correct once the Communists started a revolution in Russia. But the ideas of this book terrified the elites. A communist revolution would likely mean the end of them, their families and the rest of the elites. And the most elite people in the world were the monarchies. If the people were coming after anyone, they were coming for the kings and queens. And so the elites started asking themselves, how could they hold on to their power and wealth while avoiding a revolution? The answer? We simply give them what they want. Free healthcare, free education, abolishing child labor, democracy. According to the Communist Manifesto, these would be the reasons for a communist revolution. But if the people already have the things they wanted, then what reason would they have to start a revolution at all? But once you have a democracy, the people in charge of that democracy will want more power for themselves. And they can then convince their voters that by giving more power to elected officials, they will be able to do more good for the people voting for them. And as a result, as soon as a monarchy becomes democratic, that king or queen starts losing all their power. Not because they believed kings were bad, but because Democrats wanted to gain more power for themselves. Europe once again became divided between democracies where kings lost all their power, such as Belgium, Norway or Great Britain, some even getting rid of their monarchy altogether like France and Portugal, while on the other side there were countries like Russia, Germany and the Ottoman Empire, which maintained a monarchy where the emperor held a lot of power. And they spread this division across the world through colonization. Regions in Africa and Asia were colonized and many people who did not live in a monarchy now had one forced upon them by the European colonizers. And then World War I happened. Look at this map of Europe. On the left are the governments before World War I, and on the right governments after World War I. Every single absolute or constitutional monarchy where the king still held significant power disappeared. Austria-Hungary lost the war and lost faith in their emperor and each region declared independence until the emperor had nothing left to rule. In Russia, the emperor failed to provide better living conditions for his people, causing a revolution which deposed him. When Germany surrendered, people believed it to be, in large part, the fault of their emperor's incompetence. And so he was forced to abdicate. In Turkey, they fought a rebellion against occupation forces from various European countries. The leader of this rebellion was so popular, he became the new leader of Turkey, and the sultan was exiled. And now we can finally look outside of Europe. This video has focused so much on Europe because they colonized almost every part of Earth. But after World War II, a second wave of decolonization spread across the world. And those newly independent countries needed to create their own government structures. And almost none of them decided to go with a monarchy. But why? Well, most of them were colonized by European monarchies and installing a new one or keeping the European one was seen as returning to the colonial system. After all, if you grew up in the Belgian Congo under the Belgian monarchy, then that monarchy was the symbol of your oppression. And no newly independent government wanted to appear like the new abuser. And secondly, Many of the colonies were given a democratic government right before decolonization. And many of these democracies were very weak and easy to overthrow. And so within a few decades, most of Africa was ruled by dictatorships. And you might wonder how a dictatorship is any different than a monarchy. Well, the difference is that anyone can become a dictator, but only a member of the royal family can become a monarch. At least most of the time. 
And so these dictators ruled their country not because they came out of the right genitals, but because they were strong leaders who were able to gain the support of the elites. But some of them did have monarchies from before colonization which did remain in power during colonization and took control over their country after it became independent again. And these generally followed the same trend. In Egypt, King Farouk was unpopular, in a revolution he was replaced by his infant son, and then those revolutionaries continued their revolution and replaced this infant son with the first president of Egypt. In Tunisia, the parliament decided to take the power of the king for themselves, while in Libya, a military coup overthrew the king and replaced him with the brotherly leader and guide of the revolution of Libya, Muammar Gaddafi. Yes, really. But all that said, monarchies haven't died out completely. Vatican City elects a new pope who then rules as an absolute monarch protecting abusers. Brunei has been ruled by a sultan for over 700 years despite being a British colony for some time. And the United Arab Emirates has seven absolute monarchies, each ruling their own part of the country. These monarchies tend to stay in power because they have control over a vital resource such as oil, gas or, in the case of Vatican, being a religious icon for over a billion people. And then there are countries who have a monarchy without any significant power. The United Kingdom, Spain and Japan are all examples of this. In these countries, the monarchy lost more and more power over time as parliaments took it for themselves, supported by those who elected them. These monarchies still hold some level of power. For example, protesting the monarchy in the UK can get you arrested. Most monarchs are above the law, meaning they can do any illegal activity they want without getting into trouble. And up until 2020, it was illegal in the Netherlands to criticize the king or queen directly. Uh, funny story, when writing this script, I didn't know that they had abolished this law and I was afraid to make this video because it might have gotten me into trouble. So I was fully prepared to cross the border to Germany, rent a hotel, film myself doing the recording in Germany and then going back home so I wouldn't break any laws because technically I didn't say it in the Netherlands. And if the police would come to my door, I would be able to show my lawyer I didn't break the law in the Netherlands. But then I found out criticizing the king is legal again, so that saved me a business trip. In 2015, a Dutch activist said fornicate the king, although he used a different word for fornicate. He was arrested for, I kid you not, insulting the king. So even though monarchies have largely disappeared, the few that are left all have highly privileged positions and will often use their position to further their own wealth. And this is how the monarchy lost all their power and disappeared. If you've made it this far into the video, then please stay for another minute or two for an important announcement. I have decided to restart my Patreon account. I closed it three years ago because the ad revenue was pretty good at the time, but since July both views and income has gone down significantly. The money will go towards paying people like the audio engineer, the researcher and the animators. I won't take any money from it myself unless I absolutely have to, like paying for food or paying the rent. But what will you get in return? Well, anyone who pledges 3 euros and up will get their name in the credits at the end of the video. At 5 euro and up, you will get to see the video ad free a week early. For 15 euro, I will personally draw you as a character and you will appear in every upcoming video for as long as you pledge this amount. And for 25 euro, you will get a shout out at the end of the video. So if you have money to spare and want to help us make more videos, consider pledging money to our Patreon account. This was Avery from History Scope. Thank you for listening all the way to the end of this video. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you.